pardon. I didn't hear the man speaking at the beginning. Um, tomorrow afternoon, if the Lord is willing, we're expecting to speak tomorrow afternoon why some Christians can't keep the victory. And that'll be, I believe, at 2.30, is that right? At 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. And I have an announcement to make. If the secretary of Reverend A.W. Rasmussen is in the building, Mr. Argenbright and my son wishes to see him about the Tacoma meeting just behind the stage here, if he will. The secretary of Reverend A.W. Rasmussen from Tacoma, Washington. It gave the letter to the boy this morning, I believe. Well, they wanted right behind the stage now about the meeting. Now we are very happy to know that the Lord Jesus still lives and reigns and loves his people, and as a peculiar people, a people jealous of good works. So now just before we approach him uh, in his word, let's bow our heads and approach him in prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, tonight it's a grand privilege that we have to come to thee, and we are glad that we can say that we are the children of God by grace. And one day we were alienated from God without hope, without mercy, without Christ. And then he died in our stead to reconcile us back to God. And today it does not yet appear just what we shall be, in the final end, but we know we'll have a body like his own glorious body, for we shall see him as he is. And what a real time that is ahead of us for this great event, to see our blessed Lord Jesus. We pray that this night that he will forgive us of all of our sins and trespasses. And as we approach his glorious word, may we have fellowship through the reading of the Word and the preaching of the Word, may he save the lost and bring together the great ransom church of God. And may he heal the sick and do many miracles tonight. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Last evening I was just a little late with you, and... Um, I knew I'd be a little late tonight because I asked my good friend Tommy uh, Osborne to speak for me <clears throat> tonight just before coming to the platform, and I suppose he did that. They just rushed over after me a few moments ago. And now, this after tonight leaves us three more services, and let's put everything that we have in these services. This morning my heart was so happy, and as I go from place to place, I come out of the little businessman's breakfast this morning, I was so full I could hardly speak to hear the great testimonies of man who fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas, and hear those old warriors talking. Then when I stepped outside, a little lady met me that was on the dying list with cancer, she said, and the Lord healed her the other night in the meeting. She was so happy. Another little brother raised up, which was something wrong with him since the First World War, and he had been in my meetings before somewhere and was called out. His faith had sealed his testimony out in the audience, and he went back to the doctor, the same clinic, that had pronounced him in this bad condition, and he said, there's not one trace of it left anywhere. And just one testimony after another. Then, just as I got into the place where I'm staying, I'd been talking to one of our fine Christian brothers at the meeting, and the Lord met with us in a marvelous way. And then when we got down a little fellow walked up with a little mustache, nice-looking little fellow, kind of broken English, and found out he was Spanish. And he said, last evening you spoke to me in the meeting, 
and called me out and told me I was there for a certain purpose and the doctors had performed an operation and it would not heal. I believe he said it said they had pus on the place or something. And how the Lord Jesus had healed him and made him well. And he said that he had not been a Christian as yet. And last night he was told that he must be a Christian and he accepted Christ. Then while we were standing right there, down come the Holy Spirit right there in the street and began to move and tell him the things that had been done. It's been a glorious day to be in the presence of God. And then I wonder sometimes, I get so discouraged, it's a wonder my wife can put up with me. I go around and I, after the meeting, I feel so moody and I'll cry a while and walk around a while and say, Oh, I'm a total failure. I don't see why the Lord ever had anything to do with me. It's coming out from under that anointing, you see. See, that's... When you're up there, you feel like you could pack the world away. And when you're down here, it's all right. But it's coming between the two. See, that's where it gets you. Like Elijah was up on the mountain and he... Why, he called fire out of heaven. Then called rain out of the heavens after it hadn't rained for three years. What an he Called up 400 Balaam priests and chopped their heads off. What a powerful anointing. Then went down into the desert and the thread of a woman run him out into the desert. And when the anointing left him, he was 40 days wandering around there in that wilderness and God found him pulled back in a cave. That's right. No need to try to explain it, you can't. Look at Jonah, how he was. After the anointing left him, and he preached in a great city, repented. They even put sackcloth on their animals. And I've always thought if there's anybody that had a real good case of symptoms, it was Jonah. Did you ever notice what condition that man was in? Now, the Lord told him to go down to Nineveh. But Nineveh was a hard city to preach to. So he thought if he'd go over to Tasha, it would be better. You know, there's a lot of us find that easy routes now. The easy way. But God sometimes wants us to take the rough route, the hard way. I like that old song, I'll take the way with the Lord's despised few. And on his way down, he was backslid, and the storm came up, and the ship was going down, so he had him to tie his hands and feet and throw him out. And a big fish swallowed him. And he, the fish, after it eats, we know, goes to the bottom of the sea then to rest on the bottom of the sea, on the sand. Feed your goldfish and watch him go right down to the bottom of the bowl and rest their little swimmers on the bottom their fins, and to think this man on a stormy sea, backslid, hands and feet tied, in the belly of a whale, way down in the bottom of the ocean, vomit all over him, seaweeds around his neck. You talk about a case of symptoms, he really had it. Why, if he looked this way, it was the whale's belly. If he looked that way, it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked was whale's belly. There's no one in here in that shape, I'm sure. But you know what he said? He refused to see any of it. He said, they're all lying vanities. He said, once more will I look to your holy temple. That's right. You can't hide a saint from his prayer. That's the powerful weapon that man ever had. And he said, I'll look towards thy holy temple. Now, he remembered that when Solomon dedicated the temple and said, Lord, if thy people be anywhere and be in trouble and look to this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. And he believed that prayer of Solomon. And God rewarded him because he looked up towards the temple. Now, if Jonah, under those circumstances, could look towards an earthly temple where a man that backslid prayed the prayer and had faith and got the results that Jonah did, 
How much more can we tonight not only look towards Solomon's temple, but look towards the throne of God where Christ has died, sitting at the right hand of God, making intercessions upon our confession? Oh, my! That ought to cure any disease. No symptoms like them that Jonah had, and under the, a different setup, far less than ours, we have the best outcome, and yet we stand around and wonder whether God will do it. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. I wish to read tonight quickly. I don't forget, tomorrow afternoon is an evangelistic service, and I want to speak to you on the subject of why so many Christians can't keep the victory. Would you like to hear it? All right. Call up now. The reason we're doing this, this is uh, not sponsored by any churches. I understand it's just the Christian brethren got together, and, and we want every person to go to church. Now, you visitors here, there's a group of fine churches in this city. Visit them in the morning. They'll be glad to have you. And there's pastors here who's put whole heart, soul, and body in this meeting. And we want you to visit them. I guess they've already made those announcements, which they usually do. And then tomorrow afternoon, they have no services, so everybody can come. Then tomorrow night, go back to your regular service again. And then Monday, we'll continue on through Tuesday night. And then Friday, I'll begin in Wichita, Kansas. Now, tonight, we want to take one scripture out of St. John 14. St. John 14, 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. In other words, it will satisfy. Now that's the aged old question that's been asked through the ages. Show us the Father, and it will satisfy. And we know how Philip was answered back by our Lord. He said, I've been so long with you, and you don't know me. Well, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why sayest thou, show us the Father? Now we want to break this down just a little bit. If God is so great, why can't we see him? That's what I've often wondered. Now I want to take, for just a short subject, not over three hours, I wish to take just four ways of see God. And if by God's Word, if I can prove to you by God's Word and by God's presence that God is right here now, will you believe it? All right, we're going to speak God in His universe, God in His Word, God in His Son, God in His people. We could go on for an hour with subjects like that, but being with a horse throat, doing the best I can to struggle through, I am going to speak on those four things. And by those four witnesses, when three is a confirmation, yes, two is a confirmation. But if four will confirm it, it'll be a double confirmation. Then we ought to believe with all our hearts. Now, this no one ever knowed of God, but what longed to see God. There's just something in the human heart that calls out to see God. Now, I've often made that statement that every cult that ever raised in the world are nothing in the world but hungry children seeking bread. And if the preacher doesn't give him the bread of life, the devil will give him a garbage can to eat out of. So we got to give them the bread of life. The Word of life. Now, we find here even Job, the oldest Bible book in the Bible, rather. The oldest book in the Bible was Job. And Job was a righteous man. And how he was tested of God. Now, God doesn't tip man, but God tries man. Test them. God cannot tempt you, but God can test you, and every son that cometh to God must be tested or child-trained. 
before he can be a son. And if we can't stand chastisement, the Bible said we become illegitimate children and not the children of God because a child of God is born of God and he'll stand the test anywhere, anytime, on any condition. Right. A child that's born of God. He is born of God does not commit sin. Notice, now, Job was going through a testing time and Satan had told God, I'll make him curse you to your face. See that old accuser? God said, you just can't do it. I like that. God had confidence in Job. And notice, Satan came to him and he done everything but take his life. And when all the troubles that happened to Job, I like to see him at that great hour of testing when his members of his church came and accused him of a secret sinner. And Job still helped the test. He knowed he was standing firm on God's provided sacrifice, the burnt offering. And he knowed God required that, so he stood firm. And oh, I like to see him when he was sitting on the ash heap, scraping his boils, his children gone, and all of his riches gone. And there he was sitting, scraping his boils, and his wife even said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? He said, Thou speakest like a foolish woman. The Lord gave and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That great testing time. Then down from the east came the little Elihu, which if we had time to break that name down and show you that it means the, representing the Son of God. And any man that stands the test even to the Son of God, God will come to him and minister to him after the testings is over. And Elihu came down and began to tell Job what he had done wrong. But he didn't accuse him of being a secret sinner. He told him not how much sin he had done, but that there was coming a just one who could stand in the breach between a sinful man and a holy God and bridge the way. Then when Job caught it being a prophet, he got in the Spirit. Things begin to happen when men get in the Spirit. Business takes place. Job stood up and he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And the last days he'll stand on the earth though the skin worms destroy his body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. The prophet in the Spirit, things turn. This same Job longed to see God. One time he said, if I could only go to his house as it was, if I could knock on his door, it's something that man longs to see. And I've taken it up on myself tonight by the work of God, the Word of God, and the works of God to prove to you that every one of you can see God. It's just the way you look at it. Some time ago, there was an old fisherman down on the river where I live, and a little boy used to go fishing with him. This little boy was a Christian boy, and he went to Sunday school. So one day he asked his mama, he said, Mama, is there any way that we could ever see God? Why, she said, Honey, I don't know. Ask your Sunday school teacher. So he went and asked the Sunday school teacher, and she said, I don't know, ask the pastor. And the pastor said, No, you can never see God. No man can see God. It discouraged the little boy. So one day up on the river near the Six Mile Island, he was up with the old fisherman. There come up a storm, and as the old fisherman was coming back down the river with the white gray beard, hanging over his bosom, the little boy sitting in the stern of the boat, and as the rhythm of the oars on the water as he pulled the boat, there's a rainbow came out. And all this old fisherman started looking to that rainbow as he pulled his oars, 
And the little fellow noticed that tears were running down his cheeks. And he said, excitedly, he ran up to the, towards the stern of the boat, and he said, Sir, I'm going to ask you a question that my mama, Sunday school teacher, our pastor, cannot answer me. He said, If God is so great, why can't we see him? He said, Can any man see God, sir? It got the old fisherman. He pulled the oars in his lap and tucked the little boy in his arms. He said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 40 years has been God. You see, you have to have God in here to see God out there. If you haven't got Him in here, you'll never see Him out there. But you've got to have Him. How I love to watch Him in the sunrises and the sunsets. I like to watch Him in His universe. Let's see if He deals and dwells in His universe. How does this world stand here and can be time for a hundred years when the moon and sun will pass each other. What controls that? I want to ask you something. I watch wild nature, wild animals. I go way up in the Northland on a hunting trip. And while I'm up there, I begin to notice the little ducks that go up into the Northland and they make their nest up there in the slime and lay their eggs and the little ducklings are born. They're raised on that little pond. And then great big ducks, the time fall the year comes. And the first time there comes the snow across that mountain and the freezes, that cold breeze comes down into that pond. There's a certain little duck on that pond. He never left there in his life. He was born there. All he knows is that pond. But he'll run right out on that pond, stick that little honker up in the air, make three or four honks, and every duck on the pond will come right to him. And he'll raise off of that pond and go just as straight to Louisiana as he can go, without a compass. Brother, if God isn't in his universe, surely we ought to have as good an intelligence as a duck. But you see... Duck knows his leader, but man doesn't. God gave a duck an instinct to get away from there and get away from the freeze. And the duck listens to his leader. But God gave man a leader, the Holy Spirit, and we turn him down. No wonder we're in trouble all the time. Watch God in his universe. You go out here and... Read the newspaper, and the newspaper will say, Tomorrow it's going to be pretty weather. And you watch that old sow take the shucks off of the north side of the hill and bring them over on the south side of the hill. Don't you pay attention to what that news commentator is saying. That hog knows more about it than he'll ever know. That's right. Certainly. She's got an instinct that God gave her, and she abides by it. But we've got an instinct, not an instinct, but a leadership, and we're afraid of it. That's the difference. How that God dwells in nature, His universe. How He makes the big hills and the little hills. I have noticed all how He's a God of variety. He makes White flowers and blue flowers and red flowers. He makes little man, big man, black-headed, red-headed, blonde-headed, light people, dark people, brown people, black people. He's a God of variety. He's not a Sears and Roebuck Harmony house. He is absolutely a God of variety, and I'm glad that he is. He's in his nature, his universe. How he makes every star to move to its perfection. Everything in the heavens will move at his command. But the man that he made in his image will turn his back and say, I don't believe it. That's the difference. That's the reason we're in the condition we are. Because ducks know their leaders, but we don't know our leader. Notice, one day I was 
I go to the mountain not so much to hunt the wild game, but to be alone. My mother's almost a half Cherokee Indian, and the, my conversion never took that love of the wild out of me. I love it because I see God in his universe. It was my first teacher to sit down by Mother Nature, and she taught me of the things of God. I watch a little flower, how it dies and goes into the ground. It may be young, it may be old, but when the frost hits it, it bows its head, submits itself to death. They have a funeral procession. The sky weeps and the rain falls. It buries the little flower, the little seed. And the, all the seeds gone, freezes, burst open, pulp runs out, stalks gone, petals gone. Is the flower gone? Never. When springtime comes, there's a little germ of life there that no scientist never can or never will find. And just as certain as the spring sun begins to shine, that little flower will live again. If God's made a way for a flower to live again, what about a man that's made in his image? The other resurrection is not reincarnation, but resurrection. Not replacement, but bringing up the same that went down. Oh, I was sitting here not long ago eating a little ice cream with an old Methodist minister, and we was listening at the agriculture hour. And it was said that the little 4-H club had perfected a machine to work to produce the grain of corn so perfect that you could take a handful out of the sack out of the field and a sack that the machine had produced, mix them together, you could never tell them no more apart. Both would make the same kind of corn flakes, same corn meal. Both of them cut the grains open. The heart was in the center, the same amount of calcium, the same amount of potash, the same amount of petroleum, the skin on it, everything just perfect. And I said, listen to that, Dr. Spurgeon. He said, yes, Billy, I was just listening. He said, there is one way to find out. He said, very then. And the one that man made never lives again, but the one that God made in the field has a germ of life, and it lives again. I said, Brother Spurgeon, you better hold me. I'll embarrass you right here in this restaurant because I've just got the shout. <laughs> That's right. You may look like a Christian, act like a Christian, set by a Christian and belong to a Christian church. But if the germ of the life of the resurrected Christ isn't in you, you'll die, and that's the finish of it. You'll be gone. But they that are born again will live again just as certain as God's Word is true. Look at God in His nature, how He does things. How I love to watch the sunset. Here some time ago, I was way up in Colorado, and it was that's one of my favorite hunting grounds. And we were hunting elk. I had my horse back there, and the rancher was way back over 30 or 40, 50 miles on the other side. And it was dry that year. The elk herd hadn't come down, been no snow. And I was way up around the corral peaks, miles and miles from civilization. How I loved to get alone. They'd come a storm, as only the mountains can have it. It'll be sun shining for a few moments. Then it'll rain, then it'll snow, and then it'll melt it off, and so forth. Just changing weather up high. And it come up a storm, and I was near blowdown, almost at timberline. So I just got behind a tree and stayed until the storm was over. When the storm was over, I almost had went to sleep, leaning up against the tree. After a while, when the storm quietened down, I looked towards the west. The sun was setting. Oh, I thought, how beautiful that is. Look at that beautiful sunset. It looked like the eye of God looking through those crevices, watching the world. Just then the old gray wolf began to howl up on top near the timber line. And the mate began to answer it down in the valley. Oh, I wept like a baby. 
There's something about it that I just love. I heard the big old male elk let out a bugle, and the mate answered on the other side. I just stood there crying like a baby. I couldn't help it. It's like David said, the deep was calling to the deep. I looked around as that sun was going down. The, the trees had froze over from the storm. Icicles were hanging on the evergreen, and it formed a rainbow. And I thought, oh, glory to God. You live in the mountains. Here you are showing yourself. There's a rainbow. What does it mean? It means the covenant that God will never destroy the wa world no more with water. And I've seen in the New Testament the covenant of Jesus. He was one to look up on as jasper and starter stone. A rainbow was over him. A rainbow of seven colors, the seven church ages. As Jasper and Sardis, Benjamin and Reuben, the first, the last, he that was, which is, and shall come, the root and offspring of David, the morning star. I thought, there he is. That's his promise. Oh, God, you're screaming under that wolf. And you're screaming over here in this elk. And here you are showing yourself in the rainbow. Oh, sure, you look around, you'll see him. He's everywhere. If you just look, then all of a sudden I heard a little old pine squirrel jump up on a stump or a piece of a blowdown. I never heard such a noise in my life. Only a pine squirrel can make that kind of a noise. He's a blue coat policeman of the woods. There he jumped on the stump, chatter, 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 like he's going to tear everything out of the woods. And I thought, little fellow, what you so excited about? I'd been real kind of excited a little myself when I heard that wolf calling and the rainbow. God was so close till I set my gun against the tree and I run around and around and around the tree screaming to the top of my voice. While somebody would have come up there that thought somebody was out of the insane institution. I didn't care. I was worshiping my God. Oh, I shouted, I shook my hands, and I screamed. I said, oh, God, what a wonderful place to be. You're up here in the mountains, and you're showing yourself in your great universe. You're making known that you're here. And maybe I thought the little fellow got excited the way I was carrying on. But I happened to notice he wasn't looking at me. The storm had blowed a big eagle and forced him down into some of this blowdown. The great, big, stately-looking bird is the eagle. And he jumps up on the limb, his big velvet gray eyes looking around. I seen the little pine squirrel was all upset about him. Well, I thought, Lord, why did you stop me from shouting? Why, well, I was praising you, because I see you in your universe. I see in all your nature. Why, well, you're just everywhere here. I can hear you in the wild animals. I can hear your voice speaking in the trees. Adam, where art thou? Everywhere I can see you. And why did you stop me from worshiping you? So look at this eagle. Now, I believe that God is everywhere. And as I looked at the eagle, I thought, now what would that old bird raise up there to stop me from shouting? And I happened to notice him that one thing, he seemed like he wasn't afraid. That's one thing that's godly about him. God don't want cowards. God wants man to be man, women to be women. He wants Christians to be Christians. Make your confession and stand there. That's the idea. Not scared to say this and scared to say that. Speak your conviction. Be what you are. That's what God wants you to do. Be what he wants you to be. And don't be cowardly about it. And then I seen, yes, God loves bravery. And I thought, Mr. Bird, do you know what? 
You act like you're so brave, but did you know I could shoot you if I wanted to? That didn't bother him a bit. I thought, well, I'll just see how much game you've got in you. And I grabbed my rifle, and I noticed him, these big wings moving around. And I thought, well, he's not even scared if I've got my rifle in my hand. But, of course, if he could have read my mind, he knew what I was admiring him. But his bravery. But he knew, I seen him feeling those wings like they do their feathers back and forth. Now, he had a God-given gift, and that was two wings, that he knowed he could be in the top of those trees before I could ever get that rifle to my shoulder. And he had confidence in it. Brother, if God give an eagle wings to take him from danger to safety, and as long as he could feel those wings operating right, what difference did it make what kind of a danger he was in? What are a man to do with the baptism of the Holy Ghost when he feels the Spirit of God operating right, blessing him and giving him the deep things that he desires in the love that he desires of God, the fellowship, to walk with him? What can the devil put before you? Paul said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Even death and the grave could not, nothing like scare that old apostle. He knowed he had fellowship with Christ. He said, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, as this old eagle moving his wings, I thought, oh, I admire you. I set my rifle back against the tree. Now, all of a sudden, he just got tired of that little old chipmunk or little old pine squirrel. Chatter, 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 chatter. You know what he did? He just gave one great big jump. And he flopped his wings about twice. And he was up out of the timber. And he never flopped his wings one more time. He just knowed how to set those wings. And as the air began to come in off the mountain... He knew just how to catch that air and those wings, how to pitch it. And he started raising up, up, up. Oh, I stood and looked at him till he was just a little dot. I thought, that's it, Lord. It's not jump from here and join the Methodist, join the Baptist, join the Pentecostal, join the oneness, join the assemblies. That isn't it. Flop, flop here, flop, flop there with your letter. But it's just knowing how to set your wings into the power of the Holy Ghost. And when the wave of glory comes in, ride it forward. Go on above. If the devil tries to make you sick, you set those wings of faith. And when the power of God sweeps in, you say, Amen, Lord, that's right. I don't have to be the platform to be prayed for. I don't have to be nowhere but right here, Lord, where you are. Just right away. And I thought it left that little old earthbound chipmunk sitting there hollering, chatter, chatter, chatter. Days of miracles just passed. No such thing as divine healing. No such thing as baptism of the Holy Ghost. Chatter, chatter here. Chatter, chatter there. Just set your wings and ride away on the power of the living God. Sure. Don't have to listen to all this chatter, chatter here and chatter, chatter there. They're holy rollers. There's nothing to it. Days of miracles just passed. Just right away. Amen. Oh, it's wonderful. God is in His universe. Do you believe it? Sure, He's in His universe. Now, is God in His Word? How many believe God's in His universe? Say amen. Just one more little thought on my mind. Comes this, an infidel, not several years, 60, 75 years ago, passed to the nation, and he was making converts to infidelism. And he was so smart, the preachers was afraid to attack him. But one day, while he'd been taking a Europe trip, he broke down and come back. He went up into the mountains to take a rest. And one day, while walking out, he looked at the rocks. And he said, Oh, rocks, are you there according to the book of science? Are you there according to the Word of God? And he got so under conviction that he knelt down there in the path 
and gave his life to God. The Bible said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will immediately cry out. Something's going to teach people about God. I've watched birds and animals and can see God in his universe. We could hold that for two hours. God in his universe. Now God in his word. You believe God's in his word? The Bible said that the word of God is like a seed that a man sowed. Now, you people here in California raise a lot of oranges, citrus fruit. Did you know that that little tree, when you plant it just about that high, half inch high, that every bushel of, of peaches, apples, oranges, grapefruit, everything that that little tree will ever bear in all of its life on the earth is in it when you set it out? That's right. Certainly it is. It's a seed. And the life is in the seed. The only thing you have to do is to water the seed. Well, I, you put me on record tonight in these recorders. I have no apology for this remark that I'm fixing to make. I believe and can prove that the right mental attitude towards any divine promise of God will bring it to pass. Yes, sir. The right mental attitude. But you've got to have the right attitude. The, the attitude is what brings the results. If you say, yes, yes, I, I believe it, but I don't know now, that's not the right attitude. The right attitude is to receive it and say it, thus saith the Lord. Then it's right. Now, I believe that everything that you have need of when you receive Christ, and Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God keeps His Word. Hope we get to it this week, or next week one. God keeps His Word. He is duty-bound to His Word. His Word can never fail. And I believe that when a Christian accepts God's Word, and the Word is made manifest to him by the Holy Spirit, everything you have need of in this world is given to you right then. I believe that when a man gets born again, God gives him a checkbook, with Jesus' name signed at the bottom of every check, and that check is good for every redemptive blessing that Jesus died for. If you're not afraid to fill it out and turn it in, and I believe that we are planted in Christ, not stuck out, but we're planted in Christ, and I, you take a little tree and plant it, there's only one thing you have to do to that tree, that's water it. And it's got to drink. It's got to drink more than its potion. It's got to drink till it swells out. It pushes out leaves, pushes out branches, pushes out oranges, pushes out oranges again. It's just got to drink, 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 and push out. And I believe that's what the church, the Christians, got to do. It's just to set down by Jesus Christ and His Word. And I believe that he is the inexhaustible fountain of life. That man can be planted in him and drink and push and drink and push till every divine promise in the Bible will be made manifest to him. Amen. Every promise in the book. Everything is God. As I said the other night, crossing this world preaching, I found two classes of people. One, the fundamentalist, and the other, the Pentecostals. The fundamentalist positionally knows where they stand, but they've never received the Holy Ghost, so they haven't got any faith of what they know. Right. And the Pentecostal has received the Holy Ghost, but don't positionally know who they are. That's right. It's just like a man that's got money in the bank and can't write a check and the other can write a check, but ain't got no money to bank. If you could get them both together, you'd have it settled. Amen. If you could get Pentecostal faith in the fundamental church or fundamental teachings in the Pentecostal church, 
you'd have it made. <laughs> That's right. Then the great church of God would stand to its feet. But you have the right, the God-given privilege to every divine promise in the book is yours. Yes, sir. I know that to be the truth by experience. God's in his word. How we could say how Jesus said, Carry ye in a city of Jerusalem until you're in due with power from high. After this, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witness of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Luke 24, 49. Then those little group of disciples went up there in the upper room and God kept his word. He told Israel, his sojourn in a strange land for 400 years, be brought out with a mighty power. And by the hand of God, 400 years come and God brought them out. God told Moses down in the Egypt land, he said, I have given you Palestine. There's a good lesson right there for a minute. God's word said to Moses, Palestine belongs to the children of Israel. Now God could have went up there and shoot every one of them Philistines and so forth out. And then said, come on, Moses, just come up and sit down and take it easy. But Moses, Joshua, and the Israelites had to fight for every inch of ground they got. And every promise in the book is yours. But God will never give it to you. You lay back on a bed of ease. You'll fight for every inch you get. He told Joshua, every place the sole of your foot treads, that I have given you. Footprints meant, meant victory, and it's the same thing tonight. If you're paralyzed and can't wiggle a finger, say, God, I want to wiggle a finger. That's right. You promised me I could do it, and I'll lay there and wiggle till I do wiggle it. That's right. God made the promise. God, you told me I could put my foot on the floor, and here it comes. There it comes. Yes, Lord, it's a coming. Just keep on till you do put your foot on the floor. That's it. Fight for every inch. Things that's handed to you. That's what's the matter with the American people tonight. You've got everything handed to you. Well, furred, fattened, and clothed, and everything else. You have got no need for nothing, but don't realize you're miserable, wretched, blind. Them poor heathens over here don't have a change of clothes coming in the meeting by the tens of thousands perfectly nude, let them see the works of the Holy Spirit, God's Word made manifest. They'll believe it with all their heart and acceptance. They accept it in virgin soil. They accept it in a heart because they believe it. But, oh my, we've had too much different types of fertilizer. It sets up a chemical reaction. <laughs> what did I say? That's right. Yes, it won't grow the food right. Just let it come in virgin soil. Lord, I'll dump it all out and I'll just take you. Put it in the Word and find out if the Word won't be made manifest. You believe God's in His Word? God keeps His Word? Certainly He does. He'll do just exactly what He promised you. Now, God's in His universe. You believe it? God's in His Word. You believe it? All right, let's see if God is in his Son. Now, the Bible said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We believe that. We believe that God was in his Son, Christ Jesus. Someone says, oh, he was just a prophet. No, he wasn't. He was God. Absolutely. I believe we went through that the other night. That we know that God was in his Son. No man could do the works that he did. No man could speak like him. No man, when he was here on earth, he looked like God. He acted like God. He preached like God. He healed like God. He rose from the dead like God. He proved he was God. Right. God was in his Son. Thou the other night said, a woman that don't believe, a group of people that doesn't believe that he was a virgin-born child. I believe that he was virgin born, that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, that the Creator God created a blood cell in the woman's womb and brought forth the Son Christ Jesus, which was the dwelling place, the tabernacle of Almighty God. 
that he came himself the work in the beginning was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he was in the beginning the word, and the word was flesh and dwelt among us. This lady said to me, just not to repeat, but it would stand it. This lady said to me, if I can prove to you by God's word that he wasn't nothing but a prophet. I said, if the Bible said he wasn't nothing but a prophet. She said in St. John the 11th chapter, the Bible said when he went down to the grave of Lazarus, he wept. That showed he wasn't divine. He wept. I said, yes, he did weep when he went to the grave of Lazarus. That's right. But when he pulled them little stooped shoulders up, looked into the face of that grave, and said, Lazarus, come forth! And a man had been dead four days. Corruption knew its master, the soul knew its creator. And it gave it up, and a man had been dead four days, stood on his feet and lived again. Brother, he was four days' journey somewhere. I don't know, neither do you. But anyhow, I know that Jesus Christ knowed him by name and raised him from the dead. I believe that every man that he knows as his own, someday he'll scream from the heavens, and the whole earth and the sea will give up their dead and stand in his presence. He was a man when he was crying, but he was God when he raised the dead. That's right. He was a man when he came off the mountain, hungry, looking around on trees to find something to eat. He was a man when he was hungry, but when he took five biscuits and two little fishes and fed 5,000 cooked, baked, roasted fish and bread, that was more than a man. <laughs> what kind of an atom did he turn loose then, brother? Think that out, scientists. It wasn't raw fish, it was cooked fish. <laughs> Hallelujah! I might as well turn loose. You're going to call me a holy roller anyhow. So I'm just going to turn That's right. Oh, he holds the atoms in his hand. Sure he does. He holds all the atoms and the hydrogen and everything else. He's the creator of it. Glory to God. Certainly. Oh, he was a man. He got tired, sure. People touched him and he visions and it made virtue go out of him. One night he's laying out there on a little old ship so tired till a stormy sea didn't even wake him up. I imagine about 10,000 devils of the sea said, we'll drown him tonight. We'll swear we'll drown him. We got him asleep, but oh my. That little old ship bouncing around like a bottle stopper out there on that mighty sea and the devil, the lightning striking him, he gleaming and laughing on every wave. He said, we got him now. He's asleep. Oh, my, yes, he was tired. He was a man. But when he pulled a pillar out from under his head, walked out there and stuck his foot on the brail of the boat and looked up and said, Peace, be still. That was more than a man. <laughs> Hallelujah. When the winds and the waves obeyed him. Oh, it's true. At the cross, when they nailed his hands, he screamed, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He died like a man, that's right. But on Easter morning, he broke the Roman seal. He rolled away the stone and he raised from the dead to prove that he was God. I have power to lay my life down. I have power to take it up again. No man takes it from me, but I... Lay it down freely. Glory to God. Not only that, but 2,000 years has passed and he's still alive in God. Certainly, God was in his Son. You believe it? Sure you are. You believe God is in his universe? You believe God is in his Word? God is in his Son? Now, what about God and His people? We'll go bring Him right down here in the auditorium. Yes. Do you believe God dwells in man? Certainly He does. At that day you will know that I am in you and you and me and I Him. Certainly. I look back in the Old Testament now just a little bit, just for a few closing remarks. Back in the Old Testament, we find a man by the name of Elijah. A great man, 
a servant of God, and we find that a woman showed him kindness by setting him a little stool and making him a little room and a place where he could rest his weary feet and lay down on the bed on his road up to the mountain where he went to the cave to pray. And one day, passing through and seeing this, he said, This Shunammite woman has not been too slowful about us. Said to his servant Gehazi, Go ask her what she would desire me to do. Could I see the king for speak to the chief captain or someone? She said, No, I'm just well among my people. I'm all right. I just did it not to be rewarded. That's the way to do it. Don't give that you're expecting to receive back. Give to the glory of God. Said, Oh, that's all right. Said, I just well among my people. And, but she said to her husband, I perceive that this is a holy man. Now, if she honored him, she'd be honoring God. Because God was in Elijah. And she recognized, not the man, he was just a man. But it was God in the man she recognized. So one day, she was given a blessing and she embraced a little son. She was old and her husband was old. And she had a little son. And about the time he was about 12 years old, he was out with his papa out in the field, and I believe he must have had a sunstroke. He began to cry about the middle of the day, My head, my head. And his father said, Take him in to his mama. She set him on his lap, on her lap, rather, until dinner, and he died. I want you to notice the wisdom of this woman that recognized where God was at in a man. She took him right to the prophet's room and laid him on the prophet's bed. Not in his own little trundle bed, not in his own daddy's bed or in mama's bed, but she laid him on the prophet's bed. Wonder why? Wonder why? And she said to the servant, saddle a mule and don't you stop lest I tell you to. And I want you to ride as hard as you can to Mount Carmel. Her husband said, trying to discourage her, said, no, the prophet's not there. But she was determined to find out anyhow. So she took off, and when she got over there, you know, God don't always reveal to his prophets everything. So Elijah saw her come, and he said, here comes that Shunammite. And said, her heart's full of sadness, and God has not revealed to me. And said, go ask her if everything's all right. He said, is all right with thee? Is all right with thy husband? Is all right with the child? I here's the part I love. She said, everything's all right. <laughs> what was it? What did that woman recognize? That God was in that prophet. It's exactly right. She knew she might, she, I don't guess she thought she'd get her son back, but she would find out from God who gave him why he'd taken him. And she was in the presence of God's representative, and she knew God was in the prophet. And then when she come up and reveal it, Elijah said, take this staff to Gehazi and go lay it on the child. Now, I believe that's where Paul got taking handkerchiefs from his body. Elijah knew that everything that he touched was blessed because God was in him. See it? God was in a man. And he said, now you take it and lay it on the child. But the woman's faith wasn't in that. Her faith was in the prophet. She said, I'm going to stay right here till something happens. I like that kind of faith. So then, after a while, away went Elijah, no vision yet, walked into the room, and when he got there, there was a wailing and screaming and everybody going on, the little dead boy, many hours, laying in there on, the, on his bed. Elijah went in and closed the door and get away from all the unbelief from the outside, and he walked to and fro in the room. I like that. Walked to and fro until he felt the more abundant life come on him. The kind the eagle I was talking about could fly away with. He felt the abundance of the Holy Spirit come on him, and he laid his face against the baby's face, his lips against the baby's lips, his nose against the baby's nose, his hands against the baby's hands, and the baby sneezed seven times and come to life. Glory! God's in his people. You believe it? Well, after he had been dead for many years and his bleached bones was laying out there, they laid a dead man on him and God was still in the bones. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I know you think I'm crazy. Maybe I am. Just let me alone. I feel better this way. That's right. I feel very religious tonight somehow. Oh, my! God in His people now! Now you are the sons of God! You are right now the sons of God! You're just living under your privilege. God's in His people. I see an old fisherman that didn't even know how to write his own name. They called him Peter. He was an apostle. And the people recognized God in that man till they laid the sick in his shadow and they were healed. Hallelujah! God's in His people. Do you believe it? I can see Paul taking from his body handkerchiefs and aprons off of him. Send it out there. They recognize and see the Spirit of God in Paul. And they laid it on the sick and they were healed. God's in His people. I see a hundred and twenty climb the steps into the upper room. A bunch of little cowardly people who have been walking with Jesus on the outside. But, brother, all of a sudden there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues appeared upon them like fire. And out into the streets they went. That was God in His people. And they spoke in tongues. They prophesied. They healed the sick. They raised the dead. They cast out devils. They preached the gospel. They loved not their life unto death. God's in His people. When they see it, they said, Man and brethren, what can we do? Peter said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God in His people. Night after night when we come here and see the great transformation of the Holy Ghost move right down into this building and know the very secrets of the heart, make cross eyes come straight, make blind see, deaf hear, lame walk. <laughs> Cancers vanish and no doctors say they don't know what happened. Oh, God's in His people. Do you believe it? I believe right now this little bunch when I come in here a few minutes ago was sitting here solemn looking around saying nothing and right now your faces are lit up. Some of you's got tears in your eyes. Some of you are smiling all the way across your face. Something is going through your heart. What is it? It's the Holy Ghost feeding on the Word of the living God. It's God in His people. You believe that He's here? I believe He's here just in as much power as He ever was in anywhere in the world. Oh, uh, Yet a little while the world sees me no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you. He said, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. The Father that sent Him come in Him and went with Him and stayed with Him. Stayed with Him in death, stayed with Him in the resurrection. And as the Father sent Him and went with Him, He's sending us and going with us and performing the works of Christ as Christ performed the works of God, go with us through death and raise us up at the last day. God's in His people. Somehow or another, way down under this Irish heart of mine, I can feel tonight something that's different, some kind of a supernatural power of the resurrection of Christ moving my emotions tonight till I feel like I could fly away and become necessary at the Holy Spirit. You may think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I know just exactly where I'm standing. I know what I'm talking about. It's immortal life working now in our world because we are now sons and daughters of God. Amen. Let us pray. Will you go to Oregon, sister? I wonder tonight with your heads bowed how many would like to receive Christ and have immortal life by raising up your hands to accepting the sin. Pray for me that I might be a son and daughter of God born again of the Spirit. Would you raise your hands? I can now see God in His universe. I can see Him in His Word. I can see Him in His Son. I can see Him here in His people. Now I want to be one of them too. Will you raise your hands and say, Remember me, Brother Branham, as you pray. We're going to pray. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, my... Just hands everywhere. On my right over here, up in the balconies. 
God bless you. God bless you. That's right. God bless you here on the main floor. We see your hand. Dozens and dozens of them going up. They want God. They can't be satisfied with anything less. Brother, it's not eternal life to know your church. It's not eternal life to know the catechism. It's not eternal life to know all your church teachings. It's not eternal life to know the Bible. To know Him is eternal life. And the only way you can know Him is being born again of His Spirit. Let us pray now. Father in heaven, by the preaching of the Word, confirm it, Lord, and many has heard, many has believed. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. And we thank Thee tonight for everyone who raised their hands and made a decision tonight that they wanted to be born again. And they want God in them so they can look at Him like daughter in His universe. Watch Him in the sunrise. Watch Him in the birds. Watch Him in the animals. Watch Him in the sea. Everywhere we find Him. They want to know the Word of God and place it in their heart so it will bring to pass every promise that He has promised. They want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. They want to know the Holy Spirit in their heart. I pray that You'll grant these things to them, Lord. Give them abundance of life. Grant it, Lord. Now... As we're moving in, Lord, to the healing service, come down, blessed Savior, once more tonight, that one day that we see the big bubbles under this earth as it was, that one day the great burning rocks will fly into the skies and she'll rain all over the earth. It'll be the end then. Man will be screaming worse than he was the other day at that little shaking. Into the streets they'll go throwing their money and screaming, but he said it's cankered and it'll eat you now. Oh, to neglect God now. He said, I'll mock at you in your calamities. Oh, Father God, may men and women wake up to that realization tonight that the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish, but it's eternal life to them who believe on the preaching of the Word. We pray now that you'll manifest yourself in great power. Prove to this audience that you still live. And let thy loving service be tonight that the people might go away from here saying, Did not our hearts burn within us as we talked along the way? Granted, save every soul that you unsaved. And at the end of this service, Lord, may they sweetly come up here around this altar, kneel down and give their life to Thee. And thank Thee for giving them the courage to stand out and accept eternal life. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, he's so wonderful. The prophet tried to name it. He said, he's the counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God, the everlasting father. And he couldn't think of enough names to call him. And he said, he's wonderful. Just wonderful. He's a wonderful counselor, the wonderful prince of peace. Everything he is, he's wonderful. And tonight to weep poor Gentiles at the end of the age, he's a wonderful resurrected Christ. Now, we're going to pray for the sick. Now, everyone that raised your hands at the end of the service, tomorrow I'm going to give another kind of a service, the Lord willing. Now, tonight, I want you to promise God. Yes, sure, if you made your decision for Christ, Christ accepted it. Oh, certainly he did. But tomorrow, uh, tonight rather, when the service is over, I want to go right into praying for the sick because I know you got Sunday school service Sunday morning. I don't want it to keep you too long. But I want to ask you something. Will you come up around here at the altar call when the brethren make it? Come up here and just thank God. Say, God, I thank you. You don't realize what a great thing it is. You don't know what you've done. You don't know who you are. And as long as the devil can make you believe it, well, that was just, oh, well, oh, as long as you believe that, then your hand raising was no good. But if you believe that you accepted Christ, and in your heart you feel that you, you've got eternal life, God will honor that, stay with it. God will make it real to you. Certainly. Now, we're going to call for the sick to come to be prayed for. How many has never been in my meeting before? Let's see your hand. Just look. My, if everybody that comes each night would come back, we wouldn't have no room around here for them. See, it's almost a new thing. Each night, when I had a manager, he stood up and explained it. I hate to explain it to tell you those things each night. 
See, because it sounds like I'm saying it myself. It's best for somebody else to tell it. But I want you to know this, my brethren, that Christ lives tonight, and He's just the same as He was then. Hebrews 13, 8 declares that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, he, and if He is the same, He's got to do the same works. And if He'll come here tonight, now remember, I make this statement clear that I am not a healer and have nothing to do with it. No other man is a healer. Only God alone is a healer. How many knows that? How many knows that there's nothing in my hand or any other man's hand that can have anything to do with your healing? How many knows that? Not a thing. How many knows that healing is a finished work of God? It's already done. That's right. By faith we accept it. How many knows that no one could forgive your sins but God alone? That's true. No matter how much you'd confess them to a priest, to a preacher, to whatever it might be, Papa, Mama, that'll never do no good until you confess them to God and believe that Christ forgives you and accept Him as your personal Savior. You could scream, cry, jump up and down, beat the altar, run through the floor till you got old and gray-headed. You'd never be forgiven until you solemnly accept Christ's offer. You got to come on His terms. That's the same way it is by divine healing. We've got to come on His terms by faith. First, it's by the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. Then there's spiritual gifts that set in the church to manifest the presence of Christ. If they're true gifts, they will manifest the presence of Christ. And then that makes Him the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, the... Where have we been calling one and fifty and a hundred and... Eighty-five, somewhere. Let's call it somewhere different tonight. Let's call it from say thirty-five. Who has prayer card D thirty-five? Would you raise up your hand? We just get a few up here. You don't have to look around at your cards. Now, huh? people perhaps get it, and when they went out and they couldn't give out prayer cards, there's no way of doing it. They couldn't speak them languages. So I just had a missionary go get two or three out of this tribe and two or three out of that tribe and bring them up. And the first was a Mohammedan woman. And it began to speak and to tell her of what had happened. I asked her if she'd ever read the New Testament. Yes. And she was an Indian. And uh, I said, uh, do you know what the New Testament says about Jesus? Yes. I said, did he claim to be a healer? No. I said, then... Uh, what did he claim that he would do? What I, is what I just got through saying? I do nothing except the Father shows me. What he shows me that I do. St. John five nineteen. she believed it. I said, then the woman is at the well. If he revealed to her just their secret place of her sin, told her what her need was, I said, if he'd do that same thing to you, you know we don't know each other, would you believe it? Yes. She put up her hand. Just about that time, what was it doing? Contacting her spirit. There when it was told to her that her husband had taken her to a doctor, an uh, Indian doctor that had a black mustache wearing a gray suit, told her he went two or three days before that, whenever it was, and he waited in the hall while the doctor examined and he found a cyst on the breast or something like that. She said, that's true. And I said, well, why did you come to me? If you're a Mohammedan, why did you come to me as a Christian? She said, I, she said well, through the interpreter, she believed I could help her. And when God did that, I said, now do you accept Christ as your personal Savior? She raised her hand and condemned Mohammedanism and accepted Christ. And 10,000 Mohammedans accepted Christ right there on the ground. Right? And at the end, when others come, and when they seen the marvelous works of God... A little old boy standing there, you told him, said you were born in a Christian home. Yes, I couldn't help him. His, his little boy cross-eyed. His little eyes just as cross as they could be. He was standing as far as the end of that platform. There had been a British doctor there, and he wanted to say that he knew God was in them big lilies, big, big cow lilies grow wild. He said God was in the lilies, but he couldn't understand how that God could be there to do anything, so he could imagine that I had a telepathy. And I said, look, sir. This is not a telepathy. It is the power of the resurrection of Christ. And when that little boy standing there, his little belly bloody from eating his little blood diet, I looked at him, I said, he's a Zula. And his mother, I see when she showed him to the father when he was born, he was cross-eyed when he was born. 
way back out three times the distance of this almost. A couple stood up. There was a the father and mother of the child. That was right. I said, I couldn't heal him. Certainly I have nothing to heal him with. And I looked back and his little eyes were just as straight as mine. I said, there he is. I've never touched him and he's healed. That's right. This doctor said, I can't understand. He asked me, how that that could be? What did you do? Did you hypnotize that child? I said, no, sir. I wasn't even around him. I said, doctor, they give you license to practice medicine in England? And you don't know no more about hypnotism than to think that hypnotism would straighten cross eyes? Well, I said, if hypnotism will straighten cross eyes, you better practice hypnotism. That's right. And he said, what did it? And I said, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he ran up there and said, I want to accept him as my personal Savior. And when I was leaving at Johannesburg, that doctor had quit his practice in the medicine and was going out onto the mission fields to preach the gospel and pray for the sick. And when he threw his arms around me to kiss me goodbye out there on the neck at, the, at Johannesburg, the man began to speak in unknown tongues. A British doctor. Yes, sir. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You believe that? That day at Durban, when they had seen those things, a woman come to the platform. I said, sometimes it turns dark around the people. I know they're not going to live. I don't say it because prayer could change that again. But this day, the reason I said it, I seen the funeral procession of the woman. It was a past tense then. And I said, lady, you're not very sick. I told her what was wrong with her. She was a boor, white woman. And I said, they're not very sick. You just have a certain, certain said, that's right. And I said, you prepare for death for you're not going to live but just a little bit. And she walked off the platform, walked out in the audience and dropped dead. <laughs> right? If I could have healed her, I'd have done it. But I can only say what I see. That's right. And now I've seen that possession going on and that's the reason I pronounced it. A lot of times I sit, turn dark around the people. I say, the Lord, may the Lord bless you or something like that because prayer could change it. You see, we had time to go into it. It would be different. But I'm searching, brother. I've got something in my heart. I know that the Pentecostal church has gone haywire on some things. And I've started from New York and to the West Coast to do my best to try to straighten it out if I possibly can. You know, that great lovely church that I've stood out for, and being a Baptist has stood between the church and tried my best to bridge that thing and tear down them denominational barriers and make us brothers in one great front to go forth for Christ. I've done my very best, but I put it to God. I am at the end of the road. I preached just as hard as I could. A few weeks ago in Phoenix, when I preached on Sunday afternoon where there's divisions and men wouldn't hardly speak to one another, I seen around 200 ministers or better walk down to the altar and shake one of their hands and cry over one another's shoulders and say they'd never fuss or be different with one another again. Let that great church of God take that attitude tonight, and I'll show you a revival out of sweep this nation and tear down every nest of hell. There it is. Brother, we can preach to where a horse and our lungs fall out until the people make a move. You'll never do nothing. That's right. You've got to make a move and believe it. Brethren, do it tonight. Do it tonight. Stand out for the Word. Stand for the living Word of the living God. God will manifest it. Amen. Sorry to hold you like this. Bring the lady. Now you realize, friends, how many's been in my meetings before? I, I mean, not here, but way out of the city somewhere when the managers used to speak. How much difference it was? Certainly. This is two different anointings. This is anointing now. I've been preaching. Now you have to change right back and yield yourself to a spirit. The same spirit, many gifts, the same spirit. But now I yield over. It's never like it should be when it's this way. If I could come right to my room right here under the anointing, I could stay twice as long. But if I have to do my own preaching and everything else, there you are. See, it doesn't. But the thing of it is, here's a woman standing here. The woman's totally a stranger to me. I've never seen her in my life. Is that right, lady? Are we strangers to each other? 
You saw me before. Was it in a meeting? Or just you was out in the audience and saw me? Well, I mean, I don't know you and you don't know me. And there's no way that I have of knowing you or anything about it unless you'd tell me something now. But if you are here and wanting something from God and you a woman me a man and you are a Christian, then if... Uh, if the Lord will reveal to me what you're here for, will you believe it, accept it, believe that you will receive what you ask for? Now, of course, it's up to you. You're the one that's needy. It, it is me. Ever, ever patient. It's, it's you all, friends. It's not me. You're the one. I'm just here yielding myself. And it, no matter how great this gift would be, it'll never work unless you work it yourself. Jesus came into a city. They said, Now we heard he done great works over here. Let's see him do it over here. And Jesus marveled at the unbelief and many mighty works he could not do. Is that right? That was Son of God. Many works he could not do because of their unbelief. It's your faith in a finished work. Like I tell the woman. I watch them walk to the platform, and as soon as their real spiritual catch that expression of the, that anointed angel when he's standing there, which is the Logos, the Son of God, immediately they are under the anointing. They realize it. Watch the Spirit go to work then. Watch what happens. Then you hear them years and then testifying. It's all gone. It's all over. Some will walk through and say, well, I guess so. I hope so. Brother, you might as well keep your seat. That's all there is to it. It'll never do you one speck of good. That's right. It's your faith in a finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Now, you without prayer cards, I want you to believe. I want you to accept the Lord Jesus as your healer. I want you to look this way, and I want you to believe it with all that is within you. I want you to believe. And may he grant the blessings that you're asking for, is my sincere prayer. I just be reverent, for in the presence of God, and please, for the next few minutes, don't walk around. Just, just let me stay ten minutes, will you? If you'll just sit still that long, maybe God will do something that will confirm it. If he'll do it to this one woman, it ought to settle the whole thing. How many believes that? When Moses went out to do a sign before Israel, every time he met an Israelite, he said, Look here, watch what I can do with my hand. Heal it with leprosy. See? Now, come here, Israel. I don't show you I can do the same thing. See? He didn't do that. He did it once and that settled it. See? If it's so, it's so. If the audience now looking, believing, the woman is shattered with death. Exactly. There's a black shadow hanging to the woman which means it's fallen her. It won't be very long. She won't be here on earth unless she gets help from God. The woman is extremely nervous. She's suffering with a heart condition. And another thing, she has a cancer. And the cancer's in the womb. That's exactly the truth. That's right, raise up your hand. Now, it's up to you. It's your approach. When Martha come to Jesus, look like she could have upbraided him. And she said, why don't you come to my brother? But she didn't. She said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother not died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. And God rewarded her. You believe now that, that God has done this for you so that you can be made well? You believe it, lady? Come here, let me pray with you. Blessed Heavenly Father, I lay hands on this dying woman. As a servant of God, I ask with all my heart that you'll heal the poor woman and let her get well. I bless her in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, sister. Go believe now with all your heart. We are strangers to each other, are we, lady? You have on glasses, and that's one of the things you want to be prayed for, is your eyes. That's right. Now you're real nervous. 
And here's something I see show up. It's something in your mouth. A sore in your mouth you won't pray for. That's right. That's a hidden thing. People would say, well, sure, she had on glasses. You believe me to be his prophet? Miss Phillips, if you would believe with all your heart, you could be healed. Do you believe that? Jesse May Phillips, I mean. That's right. All right, return to your home now. Be made well in the name of Jesus. How do you do, sir? We are strangers to each other, sir. I've never seen you in my life. This is our first time meeting us. If the Lord God of heaven will reveal to me what you're here for, sir, would you believe it with all your heart? You're a preacher. I see at the pulpit. And then you got all mixed up with some kind of spiritual problem. That's right. And you got gland trouble. That is right. That's right. And another thing, you want prayer for your wife. And your wife's got throat trouble. That's right, isn't it? Go receive what you've asked for. In the name of the Lord. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe. What do you think sitting there on the end of the seat, sir? Praying. You believe God would heal you at the heart trouble and make you well? You do? You were praying for me to call you for that heart trouble. That's right. All right? You can receive it. Amen? Go home and believe it. Man sat next to you has got sinus trouble and something wrong with his chest. Is that right, sir? Raise up your hand. That's right. Now, isn't that wonderful? Who did you touch? Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. He said, If thou canst believe, thou can receive. The colored lady sitting right next to you there has got heart trouble also. That's right, isn't it, lady? That's right. Now, you haven't got it. You had it a while ago, but you haven't got it. The white woman sitting behind her on the next seat, you believe me, lady, to be God's prophet? Yeah, you look at one another. <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? Do you both believe God? This woman on this side has a tumor. The one on the other side has heart trouble. That's a, is that right? Raise up your hand. Now you haven't got it. Now go home and be well. Amen. You believe it all your heart? He said, thou, if thou canst believe. I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you. But God does know you. If God will reveal to me what you're here for, will you accept it with all your heart? You're suffering with a lady's trouble, which is female trouble. And you have a knot. And that knot's in your right side. And that's right, isn't it? Now, you believe me to be his prophet? Say, I see a little girl up here, too. It's your little girl. That child has something wrong with his stomach and has kidney trouble. Isn't that right? Go home and may be that handkerchief put on her and be made well. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Are you believing? The Bible said, If thou canst believe, all right you can have it. We're strangers to each other, I suppose. We've never met in life. God knows both of us. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. What do you think, little lady with the red coat on sitting there? You touched him. You've been nervous, haven't you? That's right. You don't have it now. It's left you. Put your hand over the lady next to you because she's had scientists for a long time. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. What do you think about it, lady? You believe me to be God's prophet? What about you, sir? You've had epilepsy. Do you believe God will heal you of the epilepsy? Then believe with all your heart and you can have what you ask for. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. What do you think, little lady with the dark hair sitting right back there? You believe with all your heart, God will heal you the heart trouble. You believe it? Put your hand on the man next to you and he has high blood pressure. You believe it with all your heart, sir, that you'll be made well? Then you can go home and be made well. 
Jesus Christ make you well. I challenge your spirit before Christ to believe that I've told you the truth because I've told you the Word of God. This lady is a stranger to me. I've never seen her. So are you strangers. I don't know you. Why do you have to wait? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Have faith in God. Here's a lady. This will settle it for the whole group of you, if you can believe. Lady, if we're strangers to each other and God knows both of us, you believe the Lord God can help me to know what's your trouble? And you would believe it? You're suffering with a nervous condition? I've just watched something take place. You've had an operation. That's right. And it was a throat garter, and it never did do right. That's right. You live in a rural district, don't you? You want me to tell you what your number is? You live on Route 1, don't you? And your box is 480. That's right. Your name is Lily Quarles, isn't that right? Return home and be made well in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe? What about you, sir, sitting there in a wheelchair? Do you believe? Would you obey me as God's prophet? You're going to die sitting there. Do you believe me to be the servant of the Lord? Get up out of the chair and take the chair and go on home. Believe with all your heart. Help him up. Amen. You don't believe I am? Stand up on your feet, every one of you, anywhere you are. And in Jesus Christ's name, be made well. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah.